Hi everyone. Um, hi, so hello and uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar, uh, which is tips and tricks for Oasis uh, GSA. Um, today we have two presenters uh, for you that will run through uh, the different uh, uh, tips and tricks that we have. Um, the first is Aditya Tiwari, a structural engineer and application specialist. And then we'll also have uh, Peter Debney, a fellow of the Institute of Structural Engineers and also our senior application specialist. Now, before I uh, hand over to Peter and Aditya, I'd like to call your attention to the Q&A box uh, that you should be able to see at the top of your uh, screens. If you do have questions uh, throughout the webinar, please um, go into the Q&A box, type your questions in, and what will happen is that when we get to the end of the webinar, uh, I will read out the questions, and either Peter or Aditya uh, will answer your questions uh, at the end of the presentation. If um, we can't get through all the questions due to timing constraints, any unanswered questions uh, we will drop back to you by email or uh, uh, through Teams, um, whichever is uh, is the best. So without uh, further waiting, I will hand you over uh, to Peter Debney, uh, who will start uh, today's, who will begin today's uh, webinar. Peter. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, we're going to cover a whole range of tips and tricks for, for, for GSA over the, these range of uh, items. Um, and without further ado, let's start into gr graphics. Um, some of the things, coming things you can do with graphics, for example, position the window. Um, that there are shortcuts for manually tiling the window, but um, also. You can use the keyboard shortcuts if you notice there's a keyboard shortcut. This is using the number keypads on the keyboard, so the, the, the nine numbers on the right hand side, not the ones across the top at the moment. And the window position is basically the same as position of number on the keypad. And first speaking, I find control five great for graphical window and then maybe something else for the others. When we're looking at the elements or members, sometimes it can be hard to see where they start, where, where they finish, and so on, what's connected to, to what. Um, so we have the shrink elements on command or shrink members command. All this does is graphically shorten the, the elements by, I think, by default, 80%. And that can help see where they, where they start to finish. Also means that it's much easier to see where um, end releases are, are connected. Graphical views. Um, a lot of people just use the one graphical view, but you can use as many graphical views in GSA as you like. And sometimes you want two graphical views, the same, at least very nearly the same. So you can then maybe change one to show different set of results and so on. So what, what we have is there is the, the paint brush effect. So open up a second graphical window, um, make the one graphical window active, which one you're interested in hit the paintbrush button, then click on the other graphical window, and it copies the settings across. And then you can just then um, adjust that almost from there. We can color by properties. In fact, we can color by a range of different different ideas. Um, so, so in this instance, we color by the section size. Um, and these colors are, these colors which are by default reduced automatically. But we can colour by group, we can colour by material, by material grade, um, and various uh, other options. Um, I mean, colour by properties is what one of my favourite ones, but yeah, there are plenty of options in there for you. Now, GSA is a 3D graphical programme, um, but there are times when you want to look in a particular direction. Now, we have the, 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 the icons left hand side for um, viewing on plan and isometric and elevations but each of these also has a keyboard shortcut so p for plan x for x elevation y for y elevation um i for, I, I for isometric and k for perspective okay, that one doesn't not quite so logical but yeah um um once you get to get to know them that they are very powerful and quick ways of, of manipulating the view um, so you can see exactly what's going on. And also, of course, when you're looking at the 3D model, it's always worthwhile rotating the view just so you can see what's what. You know, um, now, in this instance, 
Um, normally, the graphical view will rotate about the centroid of the of, of, of your model. There are times when you want to rotate about different points. So what we have here, we'll, here we show in the cursor mode, the rotate cursor mode. And what you do is hold down the control button and then left click on, on a node and the view will then rotate about that until you do one of the other um, view commands like fit view or, or plan view or so on. Um, this is especially useful if you've zoomed in to, to, to a connection. Um, yeah, to just set center the view about about that location and then you can rotate around without the without worrying about the rest of the model. Um, also, of course, there are times when you want to hide the rest of the model. Um, so this is the volume command V for, for um, keyboard shortcuts. And with, with, with the volume commands, what happens is, is that you select the, the items that you want to see. Um, so, so and if you're doing a left to right window, it will show you everything's inside that that, that rectangle you just drawn. If you go right to left, I'm drawing there, it shows all the elements that's inside, but also the ones which are crossing over. Now, if you want to go back a few steps, um, you can put the volume command and just do a single click on the screen um, to sort of make it step back a, a notch. And if it all goes horribly wrong and you lose everything, um, top right hand corner of the graphical window, there's the all button, which just brings everything back. Um, so as it should be. Um, another useful keyboard shortcut, um, N, N for nodes. Um, reasonably easy to remember that one. Um, click on the N button, um, select nodes. Now, by default, if you want to select um, a different group, um, you just select them again. If you want to select both groups, you hold the shift down and that just adds to the section. If you want to remove nodes from the selection, you hold the control and, and that then selects. Now this is dragging a window, but you can also do individual clicks with the left mouse button. Now, similar to select nodes, let's select elements. Um, e is the shortcut button. Second same principle, um, shift to add to the selection, control to remove. Um, now, yeah, the default property or um, behavior is that when you select something and then you select something else, um, it drops the first selection unless you hold the shift down. Now, there is a preference um, that we've just seen that you can just carry on selecting. Um, so this is a similar principle to, I think, AutoCAD does it this way. And if that's where you prefer, um, yeah, use that, 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 that preference. There are also options for selecting by criteria. Um, so let's say I want to be able to find all the columns, for example. Um, and in this case, all, all, all the 1D elements and all the 1D elements which are you know, vertical beams and so on. Um, run the selection. And it, it selects them all. Um, similarly, you can use the find commands um, if you know the property number, for example, to Control F or the magnifying glass and say, give me all the property beam two, something like that, and it will just select everything in the graph view for you. Um, now, coincident nodes. Um, coincident nodes are two nodes or more two or more nodes which are actually in the same same place um now if you've got two nodes in the same place which are connected to different elements these means these nodes these elements are not actually connected to each other and that can be a problem um and well, we have a graphical option for finding those which is to highlight coincident nodes and highlight coincident elements um these are usually switched on they can be switched off by, by, by default and in this case, you'll see the coincident nodes there highlighted um, with, with the red asterisk. Um, and if you want, then you might join them together with the joint um, or collapse them together using the collapse 
those commands um, both in under the scope menu. Now, the coincidence tolerance is 10 millimeters by default. But these notes here, we call it the, these are actually about 40 millimeters apart. And what we can do is we can adjust the tolerances. So default to 10 mil, maybe up, up, to, up to 50 millimeters. Um, and say OK. And you see these nodes are now showing up as being coincident because they're within the coincidence tolerance of each other. Um, which and you can then use that to resolve them as necessary. Sometimes when you're modeling, you might end up with very short elements, for example. Um, and this can be a good, good way of uh, finding those and um, dealing with them. As graphics, let's get, look into creating my models. So these days, we, we, we recommend you start modeling in the design layer. Design layer, whereas we, we, we placed members. In this case, we placed a, a two dimensional member, um, a slab, in fact. And you'll note that it has um, a preview of the element mesh that's been produced. And we've added in a void into the middle. And you see, it's automatically removed elements. And then you can pull these around, and it immediately gives you a preview of the mesh that's going to be produced. We can adjust the mesh size. Um, and these are the members that they're very good at. They actually automatically interact with each other. So just adding some nodes in. And what we're going to do is we're going to extrude those nodes down to form columns. That's the one the elements. And you know that now the members are there, the 1D members, they're automatically meshed into the, 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 the 2D mesh. And now for columns, you know, um, what we often want to avoid those, those peak moments that uh, come, that are generated within the column area, which are actually mathematical anomalies and don't happen in reality. So we can exclude those and also um, so let's add two nodes in rather than extruding a column, extrude a, mem a 2D member instead. So there's a wall now, and there's two nodes automatically meshing in. And again, we can adjust the mesh density of that wall, which then affects the slab. And so on. Now, once we have the members and we have the preview of the elements. We need to create the elements themselves, and we use this from the the modeling command. If we then change over to the the analysis layer, the switch layer, we see there are our um, our elements um, ready to, to be analyzed. Um, um, now you note know that there is a a, a right click command to switch. Between layers, but also the right side says Control Alt D, um, keep or shortcuts. You can quickly alternate between Control Alt D, keep the design layer. Um, that's how I remember it. Um, one good principle of modeling is if you've got structure which repeats, build it once, copy it. Um, so we have a block option. In this case, we've taken that, that floor and columns we've been made, turned it into a block, and then say, okay, this block repeats 10 times at forming the elevation. But maybe it also repeats horizontally as well. So I think we've got three complete buildings um, from one base file. And as soon as we change the base, base model, everything else automatically updates. Now, the good thing about these blocks as well is these are, um, these, are, these, are these store the, the generation um, values for, for, the, for, for the elements. Um, so if you have, let's say, a sloping column going all the way through these different floors, that sloping column will mesh with each floor individually. Yeah, it, it's, it's repeating the members, it's not repeating the elements copies of the members then then generate the elements individually. Speaking of meshing, um, there are times when you might want to use entirely triangle, uh, triangle mesh. 
Um, and to do this, I mean, by, by default, it will create as many um, quadrilaterals as possible, but you can force it to, to create triangles just by using a negative size in the um, in, 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 in the in the two D member properties. Now, the model itself. Um, now, the GSA model is a binary file, but we do have a GWA text file format, and um, this can be very useful for um, copying between files or editing and so on. So in this instance, um, we selected part of the model, copied it out as GWA, and then pasted that GWA into a brand new file. Now, note that it doesn't matter where you copy it from, when you're copying, copying it into or pasting it into a new, a different model, you can just paste it directly into the data tab anywhere and GSA will know where to put it. So in this case, we copied out the nodes and then we've copied out some of the some of the elements. Um, but we need more than that. So um, we copy the section properties, um, copy materials. In fact, you can copy as much or as little from either the graphical view or the data explorer as you need. Um, now, can't have a structure without loads, and yeah, um, we might, um, one of the good options uh, um, is loading parametrically. So in this case, the model has been set up with a number of different groups in that members of different different groups. And we can say, well, I want to load the, by, by these groups. In this case, we're taking group two, adding a load on. And we see those, those elements we group two have now got an additional load on them. And, and you, you can see which elements are in which groups by either um, given the group label or color by group or indeed both for that matter. So we have the model, we have the loading, we want to analyze. Now, um, Analysis don't always go according to plan. Um, you run the analysis and it goes, ah, no, matrix singularity, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's just not running. So what we have is a special model stability analysis. This is an analysis which by default looks for areas of lowest stiffness or even zero stiffness in, in the model. Um, this um, this then enables you to then, uh, once you've run this analysis, then contour by um, nodal displacements, um, nodal rotations, um, elements, um, strain energies. Um, this will highlight the area of the model, which is at, um, at fault, um, and then give you, well, well, tell you exactly, but it'll give you major clues as to what's gone wrong, what's not connected, um and and so on um yeah usually lack of connection in this case it's pin based column with um moment release the beams coming the size but yeah likewise things coincident nodes not you know unconnected lack of restraints and so on um we can also deliberately add in imperfections into the model as well so um Notional horizontal uh, loads from vertical loads are there to replicate imperfections in the construction. Um, we can do this automatically in, in a number of our uh, analyses. Um, so what we've got here is an example where so okay, we're running a static linear analysis and we're going to adjust the nodal coordinates in the Z direction or the X direction by half a percent of their elevation. Now, this doesn't change the nodal coordinates in the tables. It just changes them within the analysis um, itself behind the scenes. And once you've done that, you will then see um, automatically the notional horizontal loads. Now, note that you might need to run this several times in the different directions. Also, of course, there are um, additional options. So you might randomize the imperfections or take an imperfection from a different low case such as a buckling low case 
and, and use that to generate imperfections in your new analysis task. And then on to results. Now, one of the good things about GSA, you can show as many different results on the screen simultaneously as you like, as long as they're result diagrams. Um, we can only show one contour at a time, which makes more sense, but the diagrams certainly, yeah. So here we're showing the re reactions and the actual loads and shear forces and bending moments all at the same time, and then we can annotate them all as we choose. No restrictions. We can also use assemblies to collate results. So here we have a building structure, still maybe a steel frame or concrete frame. But there's a concrete core in the middle, and we want to look at results of the concrete core as a whole. Um, so what we've done is we've taken all those elements and collected them together and say these elements collect together to form an assembly. An assembly is a way of um, collating the individual element results. Uh, in this case, um, give us the overall bending moment for that assembly, or, or axial loads, or shear forces, or, or so on. Um, and these can be based on story level, or on or regular intervals, um, and, and so on. Also, I mean, we're only showing a single assembly here, but um, each wall can be in its own assembly, and you can have an overall assembly as well. Um, you know, and ele um, elements can be in, in multiple assemblies at the same time. You just choose w which results you're interested in. Now, when you've, when you've got the results and you want, you want to be able to re recall them, so what we can do is we can actually save the, these graphical views or these results views. And what we do, we just you know, right click, get, we'll get the graphical view how we like it, right click and say save view. Um, give us a name, and then this over on the view menu on the left hand side. Now I've got these name views. Click on those, or open up a graphical view with those, those settings. Now note that it is the view settings and contour settings and so on, what's switched on, what's switched off, but not the actual results themselves. So if you change the loading, see the results will change, but, but the views remain the same. They'll just show the new results. Um, the results are not say, saved merely the view direction and labeling and so on. Similarly, we can save the output views. Um, so if we're going to open up um, some, some results, in this case, we use the wizard to say exactly which results we are interested in. And then right click and say save output view again this saves the settings um for the results not the results themselves and once we have that we then find them in the the, the view menu as well so saved output views output. um also if you do the uh, um control w um you can see the grid form of the of the results. Um, contouring. Um, sometimes, um, yeah, you can end up with um, large amounts of um, the structure with very subtle results between them. And there is a contour option by contour by quantile. And what this will do, what it does is it divides the um, the elements up into um, Quantiles, you know, courses, and so that um, it looks at you know, um, you know, contouring for 25% of the elements which have those, those values uh, and and so on. Um, and it can be much easier to see um, subtle results. And I mentioned earlier about saving results. Now the save views and save. Um, so if you don't save the results themselves, maybe the settings, but sometimes we do want to save the actual results. And for this, we have user modules. Um, and th these user modules, um, which um, you can save either from the graphical view or the output views, um, these solve, these save the numerical results, um, which you can 
exports. Um, you can um, delete the overall results, but still retain these. And of course, sometimes you get too many, and you can start, you can start deleting them off and combine them together. Also, of course, if you if you want other numerical values, um, which you've calculated and display them on the model, you can write your own user module, import that in, in, into GSA, and then um, and then to display that on the graph review, such as um, what's one of the um, um, Singapore projects, yeah, so um, Glazed Dome, they want to display the slope um, of each cladding panel in the GSA model. So they calculate that externally, um, create the user module, imported that, and was able to display their own results. Which integration this brings on to um, ways we can make GSA work with other programs. Now, we have a, a number of different options here. Um, now, GSA APIs, Application Programming Interfaces. Now, the GWA format, we put a glimpse of that earlier. This is basically the text file version of the model. So it's not an API in itself, but you can use your own scripts to generate the APIs, and then maybe use the COM, um, um, COM Object Model API to send these GW, GWA text um, strings into the model to update it. We also have a .NET API and the GSA Pi, which is a GSA wrapper for Python. Um, we also have a plugin which we use for GS Revit, or G for Revit, I should say, called GS Revit. Now, if you install Revit and then you install GSA, um, GSA will find um, Revit and add in, add in a plugin to the third party tools. And we can use this to export GSA model from Revit. We can import the GSA model into Revit. Um, and we can have updates um, from GSA in, into Revit files, such as you know, section sizes um, and so on. Um, in this case, we are exporting um, from Revit in, in, into GSA. And then opens up GSA. And there we have the, the results automatically. And also, uh -huh, a brand new plugin, which I'm getting a lot of people excited. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Aditya, um, who's going to tell us all about it. So, the new. It's the new official Grasshopper plugin for GSA that has recently come out. And well, what this plugin does is basically it embeds the solver of GSA and Grasshopper. So it's not uh, import and export between GSA and Grasshopper. It's in fact GSA in Grasshopper. And you can use it to create models as we're doing it in. As you see, this it's happening on the screen at the moment. You can create, you can use it to edit existing models or to create models and then as you see we do it now we create a model in GSA in grasshopper and then open it in GSA so the right way to see this is now that we have one solver which is the GSA solver and two interfaces which is the grasshopper interface or the GSA desktop where we can now work and edit with existing on new models and I will show you some of the features of the plugins so as I said, you can open existing models and here I open an existing staircase and there's a quick way to get the geometry of the existing models, scale to the right units and then you see it here. It's, it's as you see, it's come in with all the supports, all the releases and and all the other properties, the loads and etc. And if we go to the next slide, as we can see that on this model now we can begin to edit like if this was an initial staircase which you might want to extend or what want to um, so as you'll see that basically all the geometry operations like move array twist morph uh, mirror etc like here we just move the staircase uh, these geometry manipulation tools that grasshopper is excellent for can be applied on existing and new GSA models as well. So here we just <coughs> extended our staircase <coughs> a bit. And then as you see, we can mirror 
the existing stack is also and it's it's not just mirroring the geometry of the staircase it is mirroring the section properties the releases the supports and everything else with it so here's a quick way to edit and work with existing models um, if, if you go to the next slide and well to while if you're working with new models, we have a range of options to define cross sections, whether they are rectangular sections, hollow sections, solid sections, and also the entire catalog of sections of steel sections, which is available in the GSA software, is also available within GSA Grasshopper. This covers a wide range of national standards and catalogs and section shapes, which you can use uh, directly within the GSA Grasshopper plugin as well. Um, you can create your custom materials here uh, by setting up, uh, as you see here, the own Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. And as you see, everything is underpinned by units. So if you just change the unit of the Young's modulus, which you are working with, it is it's smart enough to understand that now you're working in kilopascals, megapascals, etc. And of course, uh, there's also the possibility to use standard materials like S355. C30, etc. You don't need to remember all the properties, of course. And well, once we have created a section and a material and which gives us a beam property, we can start to well extract the information of the sections which we have created, like the area of the section. This can be more useful when you're working with existing models. Uh, but also we have this clever little thing called units components. So should you be working it across geographies and you want to change from, as you say, a meter to the power fourth to millimeter to the power fourth or something else, you can change that on the fly. Uh, more useful when I think when you're working with American units and you want to in, in Europe with American units or vice versa, or et cetera, you can convert units on the fly for, for any of the results in JSA Grasshopper. Um, so next slide. And now the meshing. You earlier you saw a glimpse of the new measure in the design layer in in GSA. The same measure is available in GSA Grasshopper as well. So as you see, the intersections here between the two surfaces and the points which we make, which could be support positions, for example, or intersecting beams, all the intersections are solved in real time. So in the standard Rhino and Grasshopper are good for making meshes in general but they're not good for making finite element meshes because they don't have the constraint to necessarily intersect let's say two objects at the same node or intersecting line and a point at the same node it's this specific problem for fe meshing which has been addressed by gsa and gsa grasshopper plugins uh, next slide and lastly the entire as you see it's possible to see to visualize results as contours with with a suitable legend but of course you can get out outputs as lists as well and well it's gsa grasshopper in the end is a great tool for optioneering as you see if you change some parameters the entire meshing results etc are all updated in real time which can be something you use for while checking the schemes initially or while or while evaluating the, the results later for some specific connection uh, if you have equip equipped it with all the post-processing tools you would need to to evaluate multiple options, single options, etc. So brilliant! Thank you, uh, uh, Peter and Aditya, for your uh, efforts today, and uh, thank all of you for uh, your attendance. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye.